Hi everybody, I'm here with Matt Parker and we're going to be talking about recruiter enablement, a specific uh, type of recruiter enablement, but I'll come on to that. Uh, first of all, Matt, give us a quick introduction to you and tell us about your background. Yeah, sure, and, and great to be here. Um, so I'm a recruiting leader. I started my career in executive search um, for the first half of my career, um, working around the world and retained um, C-suite and kind of VP and director of projects for growing technology companies. Um, I then um, started my career as a head of people and a head of talent um, for rate setter in Australia before I then moved through and, and most recently was the um, director of international talent acquisition at Procore, which is a, a US uh, listed, listed business. Um, I wrapped up there at the end of last year and uh, like many folks have been kind of wondering what to do, do with myself and, and uh, that invariably led to me writing more about my experiences and my observations online through my job search, which then led me to create the Open to Work podcast uh, with my colleague uh, James Hudson, who is the former VP of recruiting at Nike. So the aim of that podcast, if you, if you haven't come across it yet, is to really just cut through the noise and, and give candidates a really clear kind of view um, on how to navigate this very challenging job market, which I think for like lots of recruiters right now is a really important, A, just kind of here to, you know, to, to listen what the other perspective is from the candidate side of things, but then also um, for candidates to have a very clear voice in the kind of noise um, that we see on, on market right now. Um, so I'm doing that whilst, whilst also looking for my next full-time opportunity. Wonderful. Okay. So Matt, let's talk about recruiter enablement. Um, Let's talk about it in general terms first, because I know that you've done some things in this area. And then what I want to hone in on is the area of interview enablement, because this is something that is really topical for me right now because I'm spending a lot of time on it. So I want to find out about that. But overall, recruiter enablement, what is it to you and and, and you know, what's your experiences in this area? Yeah, so I think re recruiter enablement is ensuring that the recruiters have the, the right tools at the right time in order to be able to guide themselves and, and others through the process in, in a really efficient and effective way. Um, you know, the I've worked in global businesses um, which have really distributed teams all around the world. And I think that when you're looking at what's a central and consistent process that we can all abide to, but what but also respecting the local nuances of, of kind of the culture and the size and shape of the local business that you might be in this is where we're really coming down into like recruiter enablement at its core like how can we enable and support the global consistencies but with local nuances and that's a lot of the work that we did at, at Procore and I think that that's really really where recruiter enablement can be at its at its absolute best especially in times of you know of um, kind of economic challenges being able to ensure that you have all the information and that recruiters are enabled to guide candidates through in the right way and guide hiring managers through in, in the right way use tools effectively etc to maximize their return for the business um you know that I think it's you know is as important now as it's ever been yeah I couldn't agree more it's something I'm quite interested in so <laughs> um that. okay interview enablement What's this what's this all about? Why is it important? What are the things we need to be doing? Yeah, I mean, so so for me, interview enablement is kind of the be all and end all of a recruiting organization, right? Like if you can't um, kind of with a level of confidence know whether or not your business is um, identifying the right skill sets within hires um, and as a result and hiring quality, you know, the right people for your business, then there's a miss gap, there's a gap missing in, you know, the impacts that you are having on your company. So what does this mean when it comes down to interview enablement? Are we supporting interviewers in evaluating and effectively evaluating talent? Full stop. That is like the core of what interview enablement is. And if we do not have a confidence that we're doing this at scale, then I would highly recommend reviewing you know, the value that you feel like you're bringing um, to your business. No, I couldn't agree more. So how do we do it? What's the best? What's the best? What best ways to set it all up? And um, and is it is this about interviewing? Um, is this about enabling recruiters to do good interviews, or hiring managers, or both? Mm -hmm. Does it include enabling the candidates to be prepared? Like, mm -hmm. what are all the things we should be doing? Give yeah. us a playbook. Well, there's a, yeah. So a couple of different areas to break down. I think. Look, let's start with the science behind this, right? So um, all, all the data we've had this kind of data since the, since the '90s suggests that a combination of, of work samples and structured interviewing is the most likely predictor of success in roles. And so when we're coming into um, uh, thinking about how to assess talent, the right talent for our business, we need to be thinking about what is the assessment that we're providing behind the scenes that's going to um, increase the likelihood of identifying someone who's going to perform well in their role. 
And that is the core of like any interview uh, exercise. That's the core of any work sample exercises. Are is it going to identify the right person for, for being enrolled? So then we need to look across like how are we enabling our business to be able to do this at a level of scale? So when we talk about structured interviewers, we're talking about um, competency um, and situate like behavioral and, and, and situational based interviewing questions, which there's a lot of data behind those, and especially behavioral interviewing questions, i.e. Uh, asking you questions about your past as an indicator of whether or not you have the skill and you can do, apply that in the future as being you know the, one of the best predictors of, of success from a question structure perspective and so I think this is where we in recruiting our kind of role as a result is to enable our business leaders to use this structure to use this um, kind of these practices and this knowledge and this science to help them identify um, the right people who are going to succeed in their business um, what happens, I think, in most businesses, and I'd say 95% of businesses, is that they are, but like you know, untrained. Um, there's minimal training, maybe an online video at best. There's very little handholding. Uh, interviewers are kind of left to come up with the questions on the spot. They're not really briefed around why they're looking for the role or what they're looking to hire. Um, and so I think when you come down to like, how do you really enable interviewing to happen successfully? It's it's lots and lots of different things so it's the are you getting the briefing right are you getting everyone who's in the panel in the same room are you then providing them with really clear scorecard elements that they're going to assess are you then evaluating those in a, in a collective and, and kind of and um fair way in a consistent way are we then um making the right decision and unbiased decision based on objective evidence rather than our gut feel and whether or not that person's going to have an impact on this business and i think you need hiring manager enablement, recruiter enablement, candidate enablement, in order to get all of those things right and in order to maximise your chances of finding the best predictor of success in a role. So the like tactical delivery of this, do you think we should be building um, templates, getting everybody's agreement on those and then making sure that everybody's using the right templates for consistency, that type of thing? I think first we need to start with the decision making philosophy at the business level. So your C-suite and your CEO or your founder, what, how are they making decisions? How do they want to make decisions? There's lots of different philosophies behind this. You could have a hiring manager led decision, i.e. the hiring manager is the, is the final cut on whether or not you make a, make a, make a hire. Um, you could have a hiring decision by committee, i.e. They, they observe um, all of the information that's been gathered is what Google do. They observe all the information that's been gathered um, and then they make a decision on whether or not there's a hire or no hire. Or you have like a bar raiser style exercise, which is what Amazon famously introduced and they basically have um, a someone who's like an interviewed credit credited um you know expert who's going to be driving that that kind of decision and who's going to be holding the decision making to account at a business level so i think firstly we need to start with the decision making process and philosophy of your business um then i think we get into like how do we template and how do we build a system of scale behind this and i think that yes we need to have things like questions we need to have question banks but also like competency frameworks like what is the difference between a good and a bad um pro you know what is a product designer level two what are the skills that we are looking for in their product design level two? What is a good representation of those skills? What's a bad representation of those skills? And then follow, furthermore on that, um, what is that when we ask a specific question, what is a good and bad, bad version of that response? And so this is a, quite a lot of work. Um, but if you have this sort of stuff in place, even as a recruiter, it enables me to go, hey, you, you mark this person as a three for this skill. But in your content of your writing and your notes, it actually reads much more like a two. Why have you decided to grade this person as a three versus a two? And that again has the, means that we're making a better decision as a company stage, but also the recruiters are given a power and authority to be able to challenge um, the, the hiring manager's decision because they actually have an insight into what a two and a three, what good looks like, which they didn't have before because they didn't have this competency framework sitting behind them. So um, I'm gonna pose you a point of view and find out your thoughts. I am. Um, I think there's so many things involved in recruiting. It's very difficult for everybody in recruiting to be a specialist in all the different areas. Like the, what you're talking about here, I'm finding really fascinating because I don't know an awful lot about it. I'm a marketer. Uh, my you know interest is in is in my main area of interest in recruiting is in sales is in um, uh, talent sourcing. Um, it's in uh, recruitment marketing, it's an employer branding, it's in that type of thing. So once the candidates like in in the inter like once they've said yes, I'm interested personally as a recruiter, I'm not really that bothered about what happens after that. I just love all that top and middle of the funnel type stuff. So I'm learning a lot from you on this. My instinct is 
it is very difficult to get a recruiter to be brilliant at marketing, brilliant at sourcing, brilliant at stakeholder management, brilliant at assessment and all of those things around interviewing and that type of thing. And I feel like the more templates and the more um, like uh, guidelines and frameworks and things people have so they can do a kind of paint by numbers means there's more consistency. And I wonder how much room for individual flair there is in what you're talking about versus like what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, so I think the the reality is that we need to build businesses that are not like that are enable B players to act like A players. You know, the reality is that most of the market aren't A star players and aren't A players. And so if you are relying on trying to find exclusively build your team, that is 100 percent. Every single one of them is an expert. All those things we've just covered, you are going to be searching a bloody long time to get that, <laughs> to get those people. However, we need to build the tools and enable those people to operate as at the level that I want to set as my as a recruiting leader. Right. Like I want everyone to operate and think in the way that I think. But that's also not possible necessarily. I'm not saying also that I'm an arrogant enough to suggest that my way is the best way, but we need to all have a consistency and a set a bar. And it's my job as a recruiting leader to set what that bar is. And the reality is that no one is going to be an expert in all these things, as you've said. And that's where, you know, to a point, like the templating and the enablement, I think this becomes really important because it gives people a framework so they don't need to understand and know why this is the thing that that it that it is and why this is the way that it is, but they need to, that they can still use it and effectively demonstrate it. If there are any individual contributor recruiters sitting and listening to this, by the way, I would say if I had one advice for your career is to really understand the science and mechanics behind recruiting and how it works the way that it does or at least in a specialist area like like sourcing or like marketing like become a knowledge a source of knowledge through reading the science and the data behind why these things are the way they are so that you can then challenge like the best thing i ever did for example was read the scientific papers on assessment methodologies boring as hell but it means that I was the authority in a room saying why I want to be able to just run an interview the way that I want to run an interview. So, well, actually, it means that you're more likely to get people who are not right for your business and you're going to more likely waste your money. And here's why. And here's what the data suggests. And that's a really powerful position to be able to speak to. And we need to arm our recruiters with that data so that they can have those conversations as well, not just me because I'm a mega nerd. Great. Um, listen, there's loads of, loads, of, loads of terrific things that we're talking about here. I've learned a lot from you already. I could talk to you about this for like hours, um, uh, but I've got a business to go and build, so I've got to get on with it. Um, I uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining me and look forward to catching up again soon. Likewise. Thanks very much, Adam.